Good afternoon, cadets, staff, and faculty. Uh, again, my name is Colonel Pat Sullivan, director of the Modern War Institute, and it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, perhaps our nation's foremost military ethicist, and that is not an exaggeration, Dr. Pauline shanks Karin. I have some more, so that applause warranted, but a little premature. That's good. That's all right. We're gonna we're gonna work through this. All right. So Dr. Shanks Karn is a professor and the Admiral James B. Stockwell Chair in Professional Military Ethics at the College of Leadership and Ethics. Pay attention, United States. Wait for it. Naval War College in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. In addition to military, oh. We have like the two Rhode Island natives in, it's like a population of two, right? All right, good job, good job. Enjoy your rusty vehicles. All right, so, um, so Newport, Rhode Island, in addition to military ethics, her areas of specialization include just war theory, philosophy of law, and applied ethics. She's an accomplished author, having written two books on obedience, contrasting philosophies for military community and citizenry, and Achilles Goes Asymmetrical, the Warrior Military Ethics in Contemporary Warfare, as well as numerous articles for the Strategy Bridge, War on the Rocks, Clear Defense, The Wavel Room, Grounded Curiosity, Newsweek, and Just Security. Dr. Shanks Karin is also a member and serves on the board of directors for the Military Writers Guild. Today, she'll be talking about trust between a democracy its military and its political leaders, as well as changing perceptions of civilian control over the military. These topics advance the Dean's theme for this academic year and are critically important to your development and future service as junior officers. As such, pay attention and ask thoughtful questions. One, it is your investment in your education, and this is a great opportunity with an expert. Also, if we don't have good questions that take us all the way to the schedule block, I've already worked it out with BTO and Thanksgiving break will be canceled. So with that, uh, apparently the frogs want Thanksgiving to be canceled. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> On behalf of the Commandant, please join me in extending, now this is your cue, a warm West Point welcome to Dr. Shanks Karin. The floor is yours. Hey, what's up? So um, thank you. Thanks to the Modern War Institute and all the organizers for inviting someone from the Naval War College. Um, I hope you didn't bring fruit. Um, it is OK if you heckle, though. I'm used to that. Um, it's really, um, this is really an honor. Um, and so I have to just take a moment, because I'm just a girl from Montana with my cowboy boots, uh, and just take a moment and take this in. I like your energy. These are like my philosophy classes. Um, so I have been I have been here before. Um, I have lots of friends in the philosophy department, um, but it's it's an honor to be here. So here's the plan. Bearing in mind that the plan never survives first contact with the enemy. Um, did you like that one? I'm going to talk for about 35 minutes, which is about 20 minutes longer than I like to talk, um, but I'm gonna do it anyway for you. And then I'm hoping that we have some dialogue. I'm trained as a philosopher, so um, I'm interested in dialogue. I'm interested in hard uh, questions. Uh, so I want this to be a conversation and a dialogue. Um, I have some comments on the nature of civil military relations um, here. Um, in its connection with ethics. And then we have a choose your own adventure part of the talk. So we have two options. We have the moderate option, and then we have the spicy option. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm hoping you all are going to pick the spicy option, um, but we'll see. This conversation, I hope, is um, I hope you're coming to it in a spirit of mutual inquiry informed by obligations of truth and care and good faith. If you want to troll me, that's why I have a social media account. Um, so I'm hoping this conversation, you will treat it like this is a really big classroom and what we're trying to do is pursue truth together. That doesn't mean you have to agree with me. And in fact, I'll be disappointed if you do. Um, first thing, it's important to note that the connection between ethics and civil military relations is not one that's really discussed in the literature. As I discovered when I was asked to write a journal article for Strategic Studies Quarterly, you can read this online, it's a special edition on civil military relations. Um, and I looked around for the literature, because that's what you do as a scholar, you go see what other people have said. And I couldn't find the literature, and I thought, well, I must be looking wrong. Uh, and I called the editor who asked me to write the piece and he said, well, congratulations, you are the literature, you're writing the literature, um, which is kind of scary and kind of liberating. So we need to think about why aren't these two conversations or why aren't these two topics in conversation with, that, with one another? Second, why am I interested in this topic? Um, as I said, uh, I wrote this uh, security studies quarterly uh, article as a request uh, to address ethics and civil military relations. In my book on obedience, chapter nine, um, I have a, a chapter on this question. I also have a chapter in the Achilles book. Um, but I need to stress that both of those things, my obedience book came out in March, 2020. And it was written in 2018, 2019. So much of my work on civil military relations, including this article, this article was written in December of 2020 and something happened in January of 2021. Anyone remember COVID? January 6th, right? So much of this work was done before January 6th, and I think probably warrants some rethinking. So one spoiler uh, to start off with is, is that piece, but also this issue of the nonpartisan military, which by the way, is your spicy option. Um, is one value of the profession of arms, but I am not convinced, and maybe you all will convince me that it is the most important value. Um, and as many things, as with many things that I study, I got sort of pulled into these topics um, by friends and colleagues, and most importantly, my students. Um, so that's a little bit of sort of preamble. So we're going to start with a little discussion of civil military relations, a little discussion of ethics, so we're all on the same page, and then we will have some voting to decide which option uh, you want to pursue, and I have comments on both options, and then we'll open it to conversation. Okay, so when we talk about civil military relations, it's important to understand there are multiple actors involved. It's not just the president and not just, um, say, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, right? There's lots of, of military people involved. There's lots of civilians involved. Secondly, Samuel Huntington. Has anyone heard of Samuel Huntington? Okay. You're not going to be happy. Uh, Samuel Huntington in his seminal uh, book, Soldier and State, has an outsized influence on the debate in a way that I think is problematic. His core distinction between objective control of the military, and this is where the military is given the mission uh, to win the nation's wars by civilians. They technically have oversight, but they hand the mission to the military and say, go win the wars, hand it back to us when it's time for us to negotiate the peace. That's objective control. So it's control, but the military has control within their area of expertise and there's quite a bit of autonomy, right? Uh, that's objective control. Subjective control is where the military is one of many social constituencies who need to lobby for support uh, for their ends within society. So they are one actor among many. Huntington argues 
for objective control. Objective control, I think, has been the dominant view uh, for quite some time. But more recently, scholars like Riza Brooks, and Riza Brooks has a brand new piece in Foreign Affairs this week uh, that's worth reading. And some of my colleagues um, at the Naval War College uh, have raised criticisms of this view. I can give you some homework and reading to do if you want that. Um, as a professor, I'm always happy to give homework. Uh, so that's, that's Huntington. And what you need to understand is objective control is a dominant view, but that's come under fire. Third, Peter Fever's uh, principal agent network is also critical to contemporary uh, civil military relations. And I also have some issues with that. Um, but it's something that I raise in my article discussing unprincipled principles. Briefly, the military profession and the institution act as agents for uh, civilian principles like the president, like Congress, like the American people. They act on behalf of and in line with the interests of the principal and not their own. So the idea is the military does what it does in the name of the American people, right? Not just because they decided, hey, it's Thursday, right? It's Thursday, is it Thursday? Let's go invade Iran, right? No, that's not how it works. I'm not suggesting that's a good idea. That's just an example. So they act on behalf of and in line uh, with the interests of the principal, not their own. This is similar to fiduciary duties within business. I also taught business ethics. And then last, we have the issue of to what degree the military is a political and or partisan actor. In my book, I argue those are different things. Political and partisan are not the same thing. Politics, as Aristotle reminds us, because you knew I had to get Aristotle in there somehow, uh, is a part of our human nature and part of living in community. And politics is necessary to govern. But politics can also be pejorative. Um, as in merely partisan. And yet the military is, hopefully this isn't news to you, the military is and acts as an agent of the state. So by definition, you all are political, right? So that's, that's where the conversation has now moved to, because Huntington said the military should be apolitical, but he said that like in 1950-something, right? 57, I think. Um, but the idea is that we don't want the military to be partisan and... If you choose the spicy option, we can think through why that is. Okay, so that's a, a primer in uh, civil military relations. Secondly, and I have to keep track of time because when you give a philosopher a microphone, like I'll be up here all day. Um, so ethics, what is ethics? Don't answer that, I'm gonna answer that. I make a distinction between morality and ethics and if you are Googling right now, what the definitions are, you're going to be disappointed. Because as a philosopher, I get to define terms any way I want to. Um, so for me, morality, that's part of the perk, right? Uh, morality is any claim about what's morally right or wrong, right? Ethics is the activity of asking questions about giving justifications for having conversations about morality. So what we are doing today is ethics. And there's a difference between moral leadership and ethical leadership. You all, I think, are more sort of focused on moral leadership, which is about figuring out what the right thing to do is and leading, doing the right thing. And it's really about you. When you come to the, to the War College, whichever War College you come to, You'll be shifting more to ethical leadership, which is being able to navigate these conversations, but it's a good idea to start thinking about that process now, is that you're starting with moral leadership, and at some point in your career, you will shift to ethical leadership. Ethics is also not a zero defect enterprise. This is not about purity. It is not about perfection. Ethics is a process, right? It's, it's something that happens over the course of a lifetime. Okay, so some basic um, background there. I wanna focus my remarks on the question of competing moral obligations within the military profession, especially in service to democratic liberal societies. 
Um, I see these obligations rooted in the oath. I wrote my dissertation on oath taking and military ethics and the community of practice of the profession. So I'm going to treat these. These are the two issues. You can go read my book if you want more. But before I get to that, I want to sort of clear out some brush. Um, and this is a little bit on the the idea of that there's a moral obligation for the profession to be nonpartisan, right? Um, and this question of the nonpartisan label is something that I need to think about. And as I said before, I do think it's one obligation, but the question is where does it fit with these other moral obligations? It's a matter of tradition and law. It doesn't appeal, it appears specifically in the oath uh, that you all take. And so the question is where do we sort of rank this? So, so to begin with, I see the military profession as a narrowly defined kind of community of practice. This is philosopher Alstairs McIntyre's. That this is a citation. I'm doing a verbal footnote here. Always cite your sources. Um, communities of practice have a common history, identity, norms, both moral and non-moral, and practices that constitute the community and give and govern its life. West Point. It's a com it's community of practice. Right. And afterwards, someone can explain to me the whole frog thing because I still like I'm still confused about that. Um, I know, I know. Later, later. The military profession is one such community. Um, defined by common and unique expertise in matters of national defense including but not just limited to warfare, service to society, autonomy, and special permissions bounded by expertise. And I argue that part of your unique expertise is moral as well as practical and theoretical. Part of what you all do is exercise moral judgment and discretion to make certain kinds of decisions, and we entrust you with that. Okay, so what are the moral obligations of this community of practice? There's a lot. I'm going to focus on five because we only have so much time. First, to defend the political community of practice, our political community in the United States of America, as defined by the Constitution and the members of it as directed by the state. Do the first within the legal and moral constraints of the military profession, including international law, military law, and other professional best practices like just war theory. Uphold and defend the Constitution from both external and internal threats. That's in the oath. Do these things in a manner that reflects service to society and not merely individual partisan preferences, agendas, or commitments. The military serves in the name of society and their actions are done in the name of that society, not in their own name. Y'all work for me. Well, not just me, right? And this is the nonpartisan piece. And then lastly, the virtues of the profession also involve obligations of care. I bet you all didn't think you were warm, fuzzy, caring types, but you are, that are rooted relationally and in the specific context of those relationships. And I have discussion in my first book about uh, a guardian conception um, and the Space Force totally stole that from me, right? I'm still upset about it. The, the classical virtues of obedience and loyalty, this is where I do agree with Huntington, are frames which it, within which the members of the profession operate, but we might ask obedience to what or whom, loyalty to what or whom, and what happens when these virtues conflict with each other and internally because they do and they will. Okay, so a little civil military relations, a little ethics, and now it is time to vote. You ready? Let's hear the choice so you can make a fully informed choice. Option A, we can talk through the five scenarios that I have in my journal article for an unprincipled principle in civil military relations. Okay, that's the moderate option. 
The spicy option is to talk about the nonpartisan problem of the military profession. Hold up. Option A. Who wants option A? Five scenarios on unprincipled principle. Raise hands. Let's see hands, 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 hands. Okay. Option B, nonpartisan. Buckle up. Okay. You ready? I, I love your energy, honestly. So the first thing I'm going to say here is that you might not like what I have to say, and that's fine. The second thing I have, I want to say is that this is a problem that I'm thinking about as a philosopher. And so I want us to think through this together, right? So I'm going to tell you sort of what my provisional thinking is so far, and then we'll open the floor uh, to talk about this option or to talk about anything in civil military relations or ethics. Okay. So here's what I'm thinking so far. For me, the, the most pressing question in my in discussions with my students, so my students are mostly 0506 level, either military, civilian, various DOD um, departments, and the equivalent of our international partners. Right? Um, so the most question pressing question with my students is what it means to have an oath to the obligation to the Constitution. This became particularly profound to think about after January 6th. Um, how can one have an obligation to a piece of paper of a certain age? Or is the obligation to the values and the ideas that the document represents? Of course, some of those values and ideas have been reinterpreted, changed, and iterated over time. So how do we think about that? I recently voted. When that document was written, I would not have had the capacity to vote, right? Um, is, is there an obligation of care rooted in the Constitution that's a certain kind of relationship in a certain context? So how are we to think about what it means to have an obligation to the Constitution? Does the oath to the Constitution mean an obligation to the democratic form of government as such. Okay, we'll talk about that. Does, and I don't mean like democratic as in a democratic party, I mean as in a democratic republic. Does the military as a profession have an obligation to defend democracy as a principle? And in practical terms, what does that mean? And maybe this is where a relational model makes more sense. This returns us to the nonpartisan obligation. We're familiar with concerns and, and a myriad of events from the Newburgh conspiracy. And if you don't know what that is, Google it, it's important. To, to Lafayette Square, which happened two months after my book came out, and that was all anyone wanted to talk about, that have raised discussion of this particular moral obligation and whether this moral obligation conflicts or is in tension with the other moral obligations I talked about. So, is, so how do we think about the nonpartisan obligation and the obligation to the Constitution in addition to the other obligations? One relevant concern is with the military being used or seen to advance the interests of or put their professional uh, thumb on the scale of partisan questions. Given the practical power the military wields, as well as the symbolic and moral authority that the public, at least in the past, has imbued in the military, the deference and respect the military has enjoyed that, by the way, few other social institutions enjoy. Um, the, mil the military is a potent political temptation or partisan temptation, right? Why? Because it works. 
right? It's highly effective to try to ally yourself with the military. Can you keep the military above partisan politics? Is that a thing? If you could, is it always a good idea? Is there a difference between taking a partisan position on student loan forgiveness and taking a professional position, which might look partisan, on democracy or a national security matter, which is arguably within the realm of professional expertise? For example, if you might think the nation is about to embark on an unjust war, right? My view, which at least so far, and you all can sort me out on this, is that in areas of unique professional expertise, including the moral expertise that is part of this, the nonpartisan moral obligation has to become more nuanced. If that's required, if and only if that's required to fulfill the other moral obligations of the profession. So we can't just think about the nonpartisan obligation by itself. We have to ask, how does that fit in with the other obligations? A complicating factor is when individuals like my, my good friend who I cite in my book, um, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Millie, and other people are seen as speaking for the whole profession or when members of the profession disagree. COVID, I think, was a place, at least talking to my students, where there was some disagreement within the profession, right? Or are trying to work out, as communities of practice and professions do, an emerging view. So professions change over time. At one point, the medical profession thought leeches were, you know, state of the art. Right now, not so much. Um, so there's going to be disagreements. There's going to be discussion. Are these going to be in entirely internal or are they transparent to society? Right. So this is sort of what I'm thinking about. Right. These are the questions. You notice I haven't given you very many answers because I'm a philosopher. It's not my job. Uh, Nonpartisanship is not an end in itself. It's a moral obligation that presumably allows the profession credibility and moral authority to give advice across administrations and parties, as well as enabling it to serve in ways that preserve the other moral obligations of the profession. But it seems that, that, that it's a practical matter, an empirical matter, subject to conditions of the ground. For much of our history, the nonpartisan position of the military has allowed it to fulfill its other moral obligations. But members of the profession are also citizens. And so you all have a dual role. Will it always be the case that the nonpartisan moral obligation allows it to fulfill the other moral obligations? What happens when those two come into conflict? Nonpartisanship has been viewed as neutrality and offering a kind of objectivity in partisan political matters, much as in the profession of journalism in theory, right? We could talk about the state of journalism. Um, but is that the case? Is neutrality with regard to the Constitution or democratic principles possible or desirable? The military as a profession is not neutral with regard to certain moral commitments around war and the national defense within uh, y'all's professional expertise, right? You take positions about what's the best way to wage war. That's not neutrality. Um, are there other areas where we ought not to expect neutrality? And uh, one of my colleagues, Doyle Hodges, has made the, tried to make the case that sometimes neutrality is taken as complicity. So you see why this is called the spicy option, because this is really messy, right? Okay. I've talked for too long. Thank you. Y'all have a lot of, did you get lunch or are you starving? You got lunch? Okay, I'm a mom, so settle down. Okay, and I worry about whether you're eating. So we have what, half an hour-ish for questions. What do you wanna talk about? So we got the spicy option, we got some other stuff. 
What do you want to talk about? What are your questions? For housekeeping purposes, if you have yeah, questions, sorry. we have the four microphones uh, on the middle aisle. So just queue up there and then uh, we'll cycle through the questions you might have. When you're ready. Doctor. Today to Ryan Rolliter, coming to H1. Hey. I thought that we would start, or that I would start by asking, what do you think the military's responsibility is when dealing with potentially unprincipled primary actors, say an unprincipled Congress or an unprincipled president when trying to stay nonpartisan? Yes. Okay. I love you all. You're great. So what I would say is this is the war college answer. It depends, right? It's a rowdy. Um, I like that. So it depends. In my article, I lay out five kinds of ways we could have unprincipled principles. So it depends how bad the unprincipled principle is. The last category is a principle who's completely amoral. In other words, really has no moral commitments at all. They might have pragmatic commitments. Um, and, and the one you're thinking of is actually not the one I talk about in the article, right? Um, but really their commitment is to political efficacy, to getting reelected, to whatever it is. They have no moral commitments whatsoever. I think that one is tough. And then number four, which is there's no shared procedural values. In other words, there's no shared, how are we going to do civil relations? And there's no shared moral values, whether that's constitutional values, values of the military profession. Those two are really serious problems. And I think in those two cases, it's going to be very difficult for the military to remain nonpartisan. I think in the other three cases where you either have some shared uh, substantive moral values, but you may disagree about priorities, and where there's some shared procedural values, you, you can probably maintain that nonpartisan position because there's some overlap with which to negotiate. There's some common ground. In the last two categories, there's no common ground. And I think then it's very difficult to re remain nonpartisan, but that's super scary, right? Because if you look at world history, especially certain parts of the world, there's some case studies about what happens when the military is engaged in partisan politics and it frequently does not end well, right? So I think, I don't wanna be seen to, you know, to be saying, I don't think, that the nonpartisan military is important. I absolutely think it is. I don't know what that means now, right? Um, and I think we have to think carefully about what that means now, but are there some times, to quote Michael Walzer in the case of a supreme emergency, which I think is what Milley viewed what he was doing. And for Walzer, supreme emergency is when the existence of the state or the political community is in question. What do you do in those kinds of cases? I don't know, but that's the sort of my great question, right? Thank, Thank you. you very much, doctor. Um, Ma'am. Y'all need to like herd traffic because we go here. Uh, yes, ma'am. My name's Peter Connolly. Um, I'm in uh, G2, Go Gators, right, Sue. And my question deals with your expertise on just war theory. Okay. Um, in the element of uh, proportionality, how would someone um, who is an expert, who is a philosopher at the at the Naval War College, um, teach about proportionality in regards to the atomic bomb, the Allied bombing of Dresden, um, or even the most recent war in Afghanistan? So. Do you mean proportionality as part of use in Bellow? Um, as far as the U.S.'s adherence to just war principles 
uh, namely proportionality. Okay, because the reason there's two principles of proportionality. One is the proportionality of entering in the war in the first place. I assume you're talking about the proportionality of using certain kinds of weapons. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so that's use in bellow. Um, and so your question is, how do we think about that? How would you teach about the U.S.'s adherence to just war principles um, when there are examples that many disagree right. and um, controversial examples in the U.S.'s history? So, so I know that this will shock you all, but I'm not afraid of controversy. So the first thing, the first thing I would do, and so I taught a, a elective on moral and ethical failure, which that, doesn't that sound like fun? Um, and uh, the Afghanistan withdrawal was one of the cases that we did. Uh, but I do think it's important to sort of trot those things out as cases and ask the students, okay, what do you think about this, right? And to think about the proportionality principle, which says that if you use more force than is necessary to achieve the military objective, you are inflicting unnecessary suffering whether it's on combatants or non-combatants, and unnecessary suffering is suffering that is not morally justified and therefore is a crime, right? Now, um, uh, the Naval War College is a joint institution, so I have Air Force students who would then say to me, yeah, but what about overwhelming force and, and doesn't that shorten the war and those kinds of questions? So what would happen is we would have a healthy uh, debate and differing views on whether the use of certain weapons is morally justified or if we think of that, if it's not morally justified, it's a war crime, right? And then what do we think about the possibility that our own nation may have committed war crimes and, and how do we make sense of that, right? Mm -hmm. That probably doesn't answer your question, but that's how I would approach it. That's how we do approach it. Okay. Thank right? Because we do talk about that stuff at the War College, right? Because you got to talk about it. Okay, who's next? Um, He's in charge. I'm just here for decoration. Okay. We're going to go counterclockwise to the four. Um, actually, clockwise to the four uh, microphones. So there, and then if there's nobody there, we'll come back to you. Uh, Ma'am, Cadet Christopher Hunter, Company D4. <laughs> Uh, Ma'am, throughout the Army, we're seeing an expansion into the cyber domain. With that expansion, uh, we're beginning to see a development of autonomous or AI-based AI weaponry. How do you feel about combating enemy forces using that technology and the ethics or morality behind those decisions? Can you say a little bit more? Because that's a really broad question. I want to make sure I hit what you're interested in. So with... AI and like autonomous weaponry, is it ethical to use that in like the modern war times? Um, well, it's, in the war college spirit, it depends, right? If what we're talking about, isn't that a great answer? Cause it gets me out, out of all kinds of trouble. Um, it depends if we mean fully autonomous with no humans anywhere in the loop. And I don't think for the most part, at least not yet, that's, we don't seem to be talking about that quite yet, right? So if what we're talking about is the use of some autonomous sort of things, vehicles or weapon systems, but there's still some human somewhere in the loop, I'm more comfortable with that. My writing on AI has been skeptical of the idea that, um, that AI and or autonomous technologies will be able to replace human judgment. Uh, Paul Share, who wrote Army of None, an Army of None, great book, very accessible. Uh, I was pretty influenced by his argument there that part of what makes war war is having human beings somehow involved, professionals. So until we get to sort of, I, I would be much queasier with fully autonomous, no humans in the loop because I don't think that's war, that's something else. And then the moral justifications and the moral framework we think about with war presupposes humans in the loop, right? Or humans somehow involved. This is part of what I'm trying to think about with space ethics too, right? So 
you know, it depends what the technology looks like. Right now, I don't think we're talking about absolutely no humans in the loop. If we were, like, I'm going to start twitching, right? That's going to make me queasy. Because I don't think that's war. I think that's something else. Does Thank that help? You. Back here, and then we're back here. Ma'am, could I Jackson Grief D4? I was wondering... I was wondering how service members are expected to, or if we are expected to um, reconcile with our duty and perhaps identities that might be inherently partisan. For example, the status of trans soldiers is very much in a partisan balance right now. The next administration could easily change that. Sure. Or I think that the status of LGBTQ soldiers still falls under that as well. Yeah. Or I, perhaps more broadly, ma'am, in our oath to the Constitution, is our subordination to civilian uh, control more important than our oath to certain elements of the Constitution, such as the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment, or perhaps due process? Yeah, so um, y'all ask really hard questions. I love that. Um, so number one, there's a longer answer in my book on obedience because it's complicated, but here's what I would say. I know, I know, it's true though, right? Um, I think there's two levels to this. So there's, as the individual, you have to decide about what are your red line moral commitments? What are those lines that you are not willing to cross because it would produce moral injury? It would involve like, um, you know, a rejection of who you are as a human being. By the way, don't wait until those red lines show up. You need to think about them in advance. Um, so there's the individual level, but then you have to think about the profession, right? So I don't know if you're familiar with the case of the uh, USS Teddy Roosevelt, Captain Crozier, who during the uh, pandemic had COVID sort of surging on his ship and had to decide what to do about it. And it was a whole thing, right? And that's a case, one of those messy cases that we talk about at the War College. You may have to make a decision to engage in behavior um, either because individually you think you, you must or because you think that's what the 14th Amendment or some other constitutional value like equality um, requires. You also have to understand that you're a member of a profession that may agree with your judgment on that and it may disagree. So Crozier wrote a letter, uh, not just to the Navy chain of command, but to some other people. He was appealing to the profession, giving his, agree his arguments about how he was handling COVID on his ship. And um, Secretary of the Navy, Thomas Modley, did not agree, right? And so there's a place where you, you're going to have to navigate these uh, disagreements. Now, the British have uh, something called the reasonable challenge process that they go through, and it's a formalized way to deal with dissent. I think something like a reasonable challenge process to appeal to your community of practice uh, is important. I don't know if anyone is, uh, I don't know if you like football here at West Point. Yes, I do. Of course you do. I'm a Seahawks fan. Um, I know, I know, I know. Whatever you think of Colin Kaepernick's protests, he was appealing to several communities of practice trying to make his case about the issue of, of policing and profiling and policing and so on, right? Um, now, you could argue that he made that appeal and, and to the NFL community practice and lost the argument right, but still thought that was necessary, but maybe won the larger argument for a larger constituency. So this is a really complicated question. At the end of the day, as a mother and as a philosopher, I think you have to do what you can live with, right? But you are also a member of a profession that's expected to make important judgments, and some of those judgments are moral. 
And this is why the nonpartisan thing, I think, is becoming more complicated because some arguments that didn't used to be partisan are now considered partisan issues. Right. So I think we have to think about how we navigate that. But I would also say for the military as a community of practice, like you have to be really careful because you hold a lot of power in society and everyone wants you on their team. Right. And that's a, a very dangerous position to be in because you want to be able to exercise that judgment and discretion and have it trusted. Right. Um, so I don't think I've answered your question, but I think those are some of the things you have to think about, right? Thank you, ma'am. But it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Okay. How are we doing on time? Hello, ma'am. Um, I'm Greg Lucas Schwed from Company B1. Go Barbs. So as we transition away from GWAT, the global war on terror, uh, we hear a lot of instructors talk to us about how the United States military is undergoing strategic changes in its doctrine and in the near peer enemies it could face, but also uh, a developing problem with recruitment, how we're not yeah. meeting our quotas. And I wanted to get your opinion on what could be a possible cause, uh, whether it's uh, the increasing polarization of the political space in this country, or maybe the loss of the like the rallying call that came from 9-11, so I just wanted to get your um, opinion on the matter. Do you have any thoughts on that? Since you're closer to the recruiting process than I am. Not to put you on the spot, you can refuse to answer. Um, I don't think it's so much of politics. I've heard people talk about the benefits that the military gives. Um, there's a big problem in the cyber world where right. um, trained engineers would leave for a civilian job simply right. because it pays better and the benefits are much nicer. Yeah. Um, I think it's mostly just the military has lost its appeal and also because of the surge in Iraq and um, following 9-11, uh, especially in this transition period, there's not much of a reason, at least in the public's eye, to join, as in there's no uh, main enemy to combat as of right now, at least in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, I think part of it, and I was starting my teaching career, I was a couple years in when 9-11 happened, and I taught Army ROTC, and I, I, you know, a lot of my students before 9-11 were there for the GI Bill, and we, um, I taught at Pacific Lutheran University, which has a big nursing program. So they were there for the nursing program. And those were sort of the reasons why people were joining. After 9-11, it really was, you know, the sense of, um, you know, there was an extremist threat and defending the nation and all of that kind of stuff. I call it the Pat Tillman, um, you know, syndrome. So I think that's part of it. I think people are looking back at 20 years of, of kinetic conflict and asking, what was that for? What did we accomplish? And then it's not clear what's coming next. We're going to have competition with China, but is that going to be kinetic? We're going to have cyber war. We may have space issues in space. We're having issues with Russia, but it's not clear like what that's going to look like. So I think there's that piece. I also just think as I'm the mother of two teenagers, one's almost 18 and one's 15 and a half, and the 15 and a half year old is interested in the Space Force. But I think he's very much not interested in the military as a, like going to war, that kind of thing. He's interested in job skills and, um, and being with other people who, uh, you know, that sort of social experience, that community experience, which I think COVID has fractured that for Gen Z, right? COVID disrupted a lot of sort of expectations. So I think it's going to take a good five years for the generation that we're trying to recruit, y'all's age and a little younger, to sort out what is it they want. I know for, um, I have two sons, but if I had a daughter, right, I know a lot of, there's a lot of concerns, you know, about sexual harassment, sexual assault issues, and not just with women, but other, you know, minorities and, um, and different sexual orientations and, and that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot of like culture questions of what kind of place is the military going to be? And is it a place 
that is conducive to the kind of lives that people want to live, right? I think that's a critical question. Thanks. Who's next? Where are we at? Okay. Okay. Sir. Doctor, uh, my name is Cadet Justin Everett Jones, the company C2 in the circus. I need my own cheering section to take back to the workhouse. Doctor, considering uh, your statement on the fourth principle of unprincipled principles, <laughs> the discussion of procedural justice and the inability for the civilian side, our primary actor side of presidents, joint chiefs of staffs, to interact with the military side, uh, the side I expect to be nonpartisan. Do you believe that it'd be beneficial for us to perhaps present a mission statement, our own red lines, our own statement as a military community, not only to endear ourselves to a growing generation who may be disconnected from that uh, mission statement, but to also present ourselves as a force that is political yet nonpartisan, to to reinstate our ideas within the American people periodically. So do you mean to say, here are certain things that the U.S. military will do and certain things we won't do? Is that what you have in mind? Yes, doctor. Yeah, so I have to, that's a great question, by the way. I'm going to have to go sit down and think about that. Um, like part of me wants to say, maybe that's helpful because what you're doing is creating a line between political and partisan. Right, you're saying here's so. For, let's just say for the example that one of those things is we will not support any violent coups against the United States of America, internal coups. Right, so if you want to foment a coup, we're not going to help you. Right, or we're not going to get involved in election processes. So if you want someone to like do something with voting boxes or protect polling sites, like you, you know, we're that's not what we're going to do. On the other hand. Does that set up the military as telling the civilians, here's what we're going to do and here's what we're not going to do? And then what does that mean for civilian control of the military? So this is a question about what does civilian control of the military mean in a highly polarized, and by the way, polarization is not something that just arrived on the American scene five years ago. And if you think it is, you need to go back to history class, right? It's part of the American experience. Right? Ask Jefferson and Madison, right? So, so the question is, what would be the impact of that for civilian control of the military? There's a similar issue with a just war. So let's say the military decides the president wants to uh, go to war against Portugal, because that won't get me into trouble. You don't have against Portugal. Um, and the military decides, thinks this is an awful idea, right? They don't think it's a just war. Now, I, I ask my students at the War College, should the military have a veto? Sort of say, we're not, no, we're not going to war in Portugal, right? Should they have that veto? My military students think that's a horrible idea. My civilian students think, that, think it's an awesome idea, right? So it's a similar kind of question about what does, um, civilian control mean. That said, does the military need to think about their own culture and think about where their red lines are? I would argue the military needs to say, as I think it's trying to, that sexual assault is a red line that's not cool, right? That's not cool. We're not going to do that, right? So are there things within the identity, the expertise of the profession of arms that you could remind people these are what our moral values are, these are our normative commitments, and that that may be necessary because many Americans do not understand military civil relations. They don't see why the president shouldn't send in whatever troops he or she wants to, to break up some kind of riot or protest, right? They don't see what's wrong with that, right? So it may be time for sort of a educational mission, right? And a reminder of what the military is about and, and where their moral obligations and commitments are, right? 
Thanks for the question. I'm gonna go think about that though, because that's a tough one. Thank you, Dr. Hello, ma'am. Put at Sid Shaw, Company H2. My question. Ma'am, my question for you is what what is your de definition for the difference between political and partisan, and how does that apply to us in the military, that difference? Chapter nine, in obedience, um, but I'll give it to you, right? You all were kind enough to invite me up here. Um, so I think a partisan is referring to the agenda, the commitments, the position of a particular interest group, right? So that could be Democrats or Republicans. It could be a particular lobby like the NRA or the, if there's an, is there like an American Association of Vegetarians or something, right? Whatever it is. Um, political is much broader than that. And I think there are some times when political activity is partisan. And there are some times when political activity is not partisan. Right, voting is a political activity. Waging war is a political activity, right? Assembling to protest the government's position on student loans is a political activity, but is presumably also partisan. So partisan has to do with a narrower uh, perspective that not everyone agrees on. So partisan issues tend to be issues of severe disagreement, and they tend to be issues of disagreement about morality, about a vision of the good life, um, about visions of identity, right? And we live in a democratic republic, and part of political liberalism as a political philosophy is that the state is supposed to protect people's rights and allow them to live the life that they want to live within certain sort of basic uh, parameters, like you can't kill other people, right? But that the state is not supposed to take a position on what the vision of the good life ought to be. So if I want to be a vegetarian, I'm from Montana, I'm not, but if I want to be a vegetarian, presumably the government shouldn't be able to tell me not to be a vegetarian, right? So. So partisan tends to have to do with those narrower perspectives about which we might disagree. Um, now, there's a scholar, um, Alice Friend, who writes in the Civ Mill space, and she has a good article recently, I think it was in Texas Security Review or War on the Rocks, trying to you know suss out this difference. So I tried to do it, but she does a good job too. Right, and this is part of the important thing is to think about what's the difference between political and partisan. And hopefully you understand the reason that people are nervous about the military being partisan is you all wield a lot of social capital. People respect and defer to the military and you also possess lethal force. So having that be the purview of one narrow constituency in the country then puts the other constituencies at risk. So if the Vegetarian Alliance has the support of the military, are they gonna go to the Cattlemen's Association and say, guess what, your time's up, right? That's the concern, right? Okay. So we, we are in fact out of time on questions, so. Um, yeah.